Good morning, Grace. I want to welcome you here to another online service. If this is one of your first times watching and you don't know me, my name is Clay. I'm one of the pastors along with Mark. Mark is going to be taking us through the next sermon in our series going through the book of 1 Corinthians. We love to go through books of the Bible. If you join in with us, you're going to find that that's what we do week in and week out because the Bible is God's word given to us to better understand who this amazing God is. He's Jesus Christ, the God-man who came to live the life we should have lived. He died the death we should have died. And he rose again victoriously so that we could follow after him in his resurrection and walk in a brand new life where we are changed and transformed because of his work in us and through us now, through his Holy Spirit. For those of us who believe and trust that Jesus is God, he is the Messiah, he is the risen King. So you're joining us as always, where we get to, as we say, love Jesus, love people, and help people love Jesus. We want to do this week in and week out. Now, one of the ways we do that as a church together is by going through a catechism. Catechism is a series of questions and answers that are taken from the scriptures to help us to understand what the Bible says. How does it tell us about who God is and what we are now to do in response? So the question the catechism we go through is called New City Catechism. You can find it online at newcitycatechism.com. This week, we are in question number five. So if you want to join in with me, we will read the question. I'll read the question, and then you can read the answer along with me and those who are with you in your home, if you have people with you. And so here's the question for this week. What else did God create? And now read along the answer with me. God created all things by his powerful word, and all his creation was very good. Everything flourished under his loving rule. I love that God created all things, and he said that it was good. And this is, again, like we, we say every week when we go through the catechism, this is good news for us. And this lets us know that what is happening is not a mistake we have sinned, we have fallen short, we have messed up the world. It's not the way it should be. But again, God is powerful overall. He's created it good, and now he will redeem it once again. So we want to trust him in that. Uh, another reminder that I would love to give you, if you don't know uh, who we are as a church, you can check out our website, gracesask.com. And if you are a part of a church, but you haven't yet partnered with us this year, then you can go to the website again, gracesask.com. Look for the little button on the front page that says partner with us. Click on that. Read through the information. See what is partnership all about. You can go back a few weeks to see Mark's sermon on partnership that we had then as well. And that should fill you in on really... What does it mean to partner? What does it mean to be part of a local church? And again, the gospel, the amazing good news of Jesus and what he's done for us. After the sermon this morning, we're going to have some songs that'll be for you on a YouTube playlist. We'd love for you to sing along and join in with us as we praise our God and Savior together. I know we would be loving to get together and have a, a real band with music where we can actually hear each other sing. But in this season and age that we are in right now, this is going to be the best that we can do right now. But let's just remember that as we are singing, as we are praising God, we are doing so along with the rest of those who call themselves part of Grace Warman. And we want to rejoice in our Savior with them. So sing loud. Maybe if you have neighbors that love Jesus or even don't know Jesus, sing loud enough that they're wondering what the heck is going on in that house. So let's, uh, let's pray and set our hearts right to hear from God's word before Mark takes us through the next sermon in 1 Corinthians. Father, I thank you so much that you love us, that you're with us. Thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you that everything you do is good. Help us to enjoy you this morning. Help us to see what you want us to see in your word. Give us open ears and open eyes and help us to know that you are with us, you love us, and you want what's best for us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's let Mark, take us through the next portion in 1 Corinthians. Good morning, Grace. Welcome to our online gathering this morning. We would love it if you would just comment and interact along with us and with one another during the streaming event this morning. It gives us just this little sense of uh, being with one another even when we can't be with one another physically. And today we're going to be continuing on with our series in the book of, or I guess the letter 
of 1 Corinthians. And so if you would turn with me to that book of the Bible, that letter that Paul wrote, that would be great. You're going to find that it's in the New Testament section of the Bible. It's somewhere near the end of the Bible if you have a paper copy. Today we're going to be taking verses 10 to 17 of chapter 1. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 to 17. I think you're going to find that um, it is easier to understand and connect the dots together in the scripture passage when you have it open in front of you following along with me as we go through it together. All right, so we're going to play the verses out on the screen, then we're going to pray, and then we're going to go through this passage and see what God has in store for us through his word today. Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 to 17. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Father, we thank you today for your grace and your mercy towards us, that you would bring us into your kingdom and into your church. We don't deserve a privilege such as this, but you have done this for us, and we're grateful for this. I pray that you would help us to understand your scripture this morning as we go through it, so that the truth of what Paul wrote to these Corinthian people through the power of your spirit would not be lost on us. I pray that we benefit from the passage just as this Corinthian church benefited from Paul's letter. I pray that we take the words that you wrote through Paul very seriously and understand that we're not very different from this original audience. And we too have these same issues that Paul so clearly addresses in this book. Issues that need to be looked at and addressed through the lens of the gospel and fixed by the power of the gospel. I just pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, so just by way of context, You have likely heard over the last two weeks as we have introduced you to Paul and to this church in the city of Corinth that you have likely known that this church is a messed up church. And as we go through this book, we will see some things that are shocking, blatant and gross sin going on within this church. And it's not surprising what was happening either as this church was located in a wealthy city and a that this city had the moral reputation of a place like Las Vegas. It was well off financially and generally the population had very or little no or little or no moral standards at all. This was a messed up place. And some of the practices of this city had infiltrated the church, as we're gonna see as we go through this letter. Last week we saw in verses four to nine that Paul he doesn't immediately just blast this church with his hot anger for all the gross and blatant sin that is going on in the church. But he lets them know that despite all that he has been told that is going on in the church in Corinth, he's genuinely thankful and grateful for them. He loves them as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, despite all the the disheartening news about them that he is hearing about this sin that is going on in this church that has been told to him. So today, however, he starts to get into some of the sin that's going on in the church. And he starts to pick at the things that are happening within the church that shouldn't be going on. And and the very first subject that he touches is the division and the fighting that's showing itself in the people of the church. So let's read verses 10 and 11 of our text today, 1 Corinthians verses 1, or, or sorry, chapter 1, verses 10 and 11 of our text. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment, for it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. 
Now, I want you to notice Paul's tone in this very first exhortation in this book. He doesn't come out with guns ablazing, ready to take off their heads because of their disagreements and the division that is obviously going on. He could have used much harsher language. He could have commanded them in the name of Jesus that they, they just agree and that they get along, but rather he appeals to them. You could say he's pleading with them. He loves these people and he wants to get them to the point where the obedience comes from the heart. And so he appeals, or you could say he begs them, please get along, please stop fighting for the sake of Jesus and the gospel. Be united in what you do as a church so that the world will know who Jesus is and why he came. Those of you who are parents will probably have experienced exactly what Paul has experienced here. When we as parents see our children uh, fight and argue, disagreeing over everything and anything for the sake of disagreeing, it drives us nuts. I can hardly stand it when my boys do that. So my response to my kids when they fight is often a response of anger. Stop fighting right now or else. And I command them to be obedient. I command them to love one another or else. If they don't clean up their act and love one another, the hammer will drop. Not saying that this is the correct approach. I want you to understand that. Just saying that, unfortunately, this is this method is my natural tendency. Well, Paul didn't take that route with these Corinthian people who are fighting amongst one another. He takes a much more loving approach here. He doesn't command unity. He doesn't command them to love one another. He doesn't command them to stop fighting. He appeals to them from the bottom of his heart. He loves them. And he wants their obedience to come from their heart. And he wants them to stop fighting because they love one another. He wants genuine unity from the heart. He doesn't want unity and agreement that comes from a command from an apostle. He wants true unity, not some fake unity that will be on display only as long as he's watching them. He doesn't want the type of unity and love that our kids show uh, one another when we tell them to stop fighting. Then as soon as we're gone, they, they continue with their spat only quieter so that mom and dad don't hear what's going on. This isn't what Paul wants. He doesn't want them to hide their sin. He wants genuine love for one another, genuine unity and th of thought and of mind, genuine unity of mission, genuine unity of Jesus in the gospel message. And Paul wants this for the church because Jesus wanted this for his church. Right before Jesus died on the cross to pay for the sin of these people, this Corinthian church, and for us, to bring them into his kingdom, into his church, he prayed to God the Father. And this is part of the prayer of Jesus right before he hung on the cross. John chapter 17, verses 20 to 21. The prayer is the entire chapter of John 17, but in these two verses, he says this, I do not ask for these only, he had been praying for his disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So this is us and any other Christian throughout church history, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus himself prayed that all believers in him would be one, unified in Jesus and the good news of his gospel. The good news that we have been saved from sin and saved from eternal life with Jesus because of what he has accomplished on the cross and by his resurrection. Jesus wants us to be one in mission, reaching the lost with the gospel. He wants us to be one, unified in how we operate as a church, a bunch of different types of people from different places, all striving for the same thing, the good news of the gospel to be proclaimed, to grow closer to Jesus and to show the world around us that Jesus is God and that what he did when he came to earth was so that we would not have to be destroyed by Satan, sin, and death, but rather that we might have eternal life, riches beyond compare, and joy unspeakable. This is the real reason for the unity that we ought to have. And this unity ought to come out of a heart of understanding how unworthy we all are to be a part of the church and how worthy Jesus is of glory. This unity cannot be something that's commanded. It is something that is offered to one another because of a love for one another. 
and the one who has saved us, Jesus Christ. And so Paul, he appeals to them for this type of unity. Now, you might wonder what type of disunity and arguing is going on um, in this church specifically. Well, Paul, he addresses that in the very next verses, verses 11 and 12. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. So essentially, what has happened is there's almost like these political parties forming within the church. Now, some claim they follow Paul, the one who had planted this church. He was the one who got things going for the church in Corinth. So he's the one that they're pledging their allegiance to. Paul is their guy. Paul is the OG of church planting, and he planted the church in Corinth. And so some of those who might have been there from the very first days of this church plant, they were claiming that they only had to follow Paul. In other words, if Apollos or Cephas, who is the Apostle Peter, would teach or write to them, they would totally disregard what was taught or written because they only followed Paul. He was their favorite. Forget about the other guys and what they said. They did not matter. Paul was the only one that they would listen to. And this is a huge problem because there was this other guy who was named Apollos who had spent some time at the church and he had come through Corinth sometime after Paul had planted this church and he had taught there. And if we look in Acts chapter 18, we see that Apollos was a guy that was very eloquent in the way that he spoke. This would have likely caused the Corinthians to look upon him favorably because they were used to these high-ranking and these famous philosophers and speakers making their way through the city. And so this Apollos guy, with his eloquent speech and his excellent knowledge of the scriptures, well, he would have really appealed to some of them. And so some in the church claimed to follow Apollos. He was their guy. Didn't matter what Paul said. It didn't matter what Peter said. Only Apollos. And then we have Cephas, who is Peter. He was the one whom Jesus called the rock. He was an apostle who spent time on earth with Jesus. He was one of the originals. So then we have a subset of these Corinthian people claiming that they only follow Peter. It doesn't matter what Paul says. It doesn't matter what Apollos says. If Peter didn't specifically address the issue and Paul or Apollos did, well, it just did not matter. Peter's my guy, so I don't need to listen to anyone else. And so you could see why this would cause a lot of fighting. Peter might have written or taught something and those who followed him would have understood the importance of what he's teaching and they would have wanted everyone to understand and to obey all that Peter had taught. But those who followed Paul or Apollos, well, they would have disregarded that teaching and that would have caused fights. The same thing would happen with the teaching of Paul or Apollos. And so you can see that there was an attitude of, I don't have to listen to that teaching because I don't like the guy that's teaching it. This would have caused some serious tension in the church. And it's not that these three were teaching something completely different or opposed to one another. It'd be more like when Clay preaches on a Sunday and he addresses something that we find in the scriptures. Say he would preach uh, about what gospel generosity looks like and then half of Grace Warman would all be on board with this teaching and it would make the necessary changes in their life so that they were living with gospel-centered generosity, giving all that they have because Jesus has given all for them. And then we have the other half of Grace Warman completely ignoring the teaching because it didn't come from Mark's lips. And then the next Sunday I would preach on the next passage about, say, patience and suffering. So the opposite half of the church would take the teaching to heart and make changes in their lives and lives are in line with gospel-centered patience and gospel-centered suffering. And the other group of people who followed Clay would completely ignore my teaching because it didn't come from Clay's lips. So you have one group is mad at the other group because they didn't take to heart the teaching of their guy. So here you have the vision. It's not that Clay and I are teaching things that are opposed to each other. It's just that we are teaching different aspects of the good news of the gospel. We are one. We are both under the teaching of Jesus and both of us are teaching what he has called us to teach. It doesn't matter whose lips it comes from. Now, Imagine the disunity when you have three teachers who love Jesus, who teach the truth of the gospel, but the people will only listen to and support the teaching of those that they love the most. This was causing all sorts of disunity, arguing over whose teaching is better or whose is valid. What a mess. And then you have the group that they say they follow Jesus Christ alone. 
still in verse 12. Now, on the surface, that sounds really good. I follow Jesus alone. It sounds noble, but at the heart of their declaration of being Jesus followers, we can see that it was a sinful declaration. Their attitude was, if Jesus did not say it, then I do not have to listen. I don't have to believe that. I don't have to be obedient to that teaching. Who are Paul? Who is Paulus? Who is Peter? Who do they think they are? I don't have to listen to any of these earthly teachers. I follow Jesus. Unfortunately, we do have the same issue today. It has never gone away. Some will say they do not need the church. They have Jesus and the Bible. They don't need to listen to anything else. They claim the church is not necessary as long as they have their Bible. As long as they believe in Jesus, they don't need to listen to anything else. They don't need fellow believers to speak into their lives. They don't need qualified elders to exercise wisdom in teaching them or, heaven forbid, correcting or disciplining them. They don't need anything other than the Bible. They don't need anything but Jesus. As noble as it sounds to follow Jesus only, there is a big problem with this proclamation that these people were proclaiming in the Corinthian church. You see, Jesus was the one who had called Peter to be one of the founders of the New Testament church and to teach the people about Jesus. Jesus called Paul to be a missionary church planter and declare the good news that Jesus had come to save his people all over the known world, Jew and Gentile. God was the one who through the Holy Spirit had given Apollos his excellent knowledge of scriptures in his eloquent speech declaring that Jesus was the Messiah to those who were educated in the Old Testament scriptures and yet still refused to believe. When you claim to follow Jesus alone and clearly and blatantly reject all those who he has put in place to teach the gospel and how the gospel changes you, then you are rejecting Jesus by saying that you follow Jesus alone. It's not a true statement. If you reject the ones who are pointing you to Jesus, and teaching you the gospel of Jesus, then you are rejecting Jesus, even though you say you only follow Jesus. Jesus had clearly given Peter a mission. Jesus had clearly given Paul a mission. And Jesus had clearly given Apollos a mission by the power of the Spirit. We see all of these present, these guys present in the book of Acts. And so if the church refused to listen to the teachers that Jesus sent, well then, they were rejecting Jesus by rejecting those whom Jesus had called to do his work. It's the same today. If you're part of a gospel-centered church, a church that loves Jesus, and you don't want to listen to those whom God has put in place over you or around you, claiming that they are not Jesus, which is very true, then you are still still rejecting those whom God has called and sent to be a part of your lives. In the same way, if you reject the church that God has called you to be a part of, you are rejecting ones that Jesus has called to be in your lives. You are rejecting the exhortation, the encouragement, and the teaching that Jesus has for you. Claiming you don't need a church to be a part of, you just need a Bible and Jesus, it shows that you reject what Jesus has for you. He designed us to be in community with one another, for the good of one another. Rejecting the true church, rejecting true brothers and sisters in Christ, rejecting the true gospel teachers is rejecting what Jesus has for you and rejecting Jesus. Paul says this in verse 13 to 16 of our text today. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that none of you may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. Is Christ divided? The answer to Paul's question to them is a rhetorical, no, Jesus is not divided and neither should his church be divided. Again, Jesus prayed that we as the church would be one as he and the Father are one. And, and the reason is so that the world will know that he is the Son of God sent to save the lost, sent by God the Father. So Paul would rather they all follow another teacher than himself if it means more unity in the church. He was glad that they had baptized, or that he had baptized hardly any of these believers so that they could not claim to be some superior believers because they had been baptized by Paul. He doesn't want that type of disunity in the church. Paul wanted these people to know there was nothing special about who he was, but there was something very special about the message 
and the subject of his message, Jesus Christ, that he was called to proclaim to them as a church. There was nothing special about Apollos. There was nothing special about Paul. There was nothing special about Peter, but there was something very special about the gospel of Jesus Christ that he had been tasked to teach the Corinthian church. And it was Jesus who had tasked them with this task, with declaring this task to declare this message. Verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. The unifying factor in this Corinthian church was supposed to be the message of the gospel. It wasn't supposed to be the teacher, but the message. And that was Paul's mission, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. If people truly followed Jesus alone, they would embrace the gospel message from Paul, from Apollos, and from Peter. And the teaching from all three of these guys would point them to Jesus and the good news of the gospel. This should be what unifies us as Grace Warman as well. It should not be if I teach or if Clay teaches, but the unifying factor should be the content of what we teach. Jesus Christ and his gospel message, the message of the cross and the resurrection, because it is in the content of this message that we can all be united. The message of the Son of God who came to earth to live among us perfectly and to die an unjust death on the cross so that our sins could be paid for. This is the message that we ought to embrace. We need not worry who preaches this message, only that this message is preached and believed because it is the message that helps us to see that we're all sinners in need of a savior. Jesus was and is that savior. He is the one who paid the price so that we wouldn't have to. There is no better news than that. And he didn't stay dead. He rose again so that we might never have to taste death, but rather that we get ushered into his presence for eternity. And this is the good news that we ought to be unified around. And like Paul, Clay and I are going to preach this good news. We may not be as eloquent as Apollos or as bold as Peter or as energetic as Paul, but the message we need to proclaim is a message that ought to resonate with all of us, causing us to bond together by the fact that we are all sinners, saved only by the grace of Jesus Christ. And as this message is proclaimed and believed, we will see if we truly believe it, if we truly believe this message, it starts to change us. We become more and more like Jesus until the day that we die and we enter that perfect state with Jesus face to face forevermore. And God will use the people in the church to help you grow in the knowledge of this gospel and in the knowledge of how this good news of the gospel changes us. Whether it's me preaching or Clay preaching or a brother and sister um, who encourages us in prayer, God uses all of us to sharpen one another, to help us see Jesus more clearly so that we don't follow one person or another person. We follow Jesus, but not in the same sense that the Corinthians followed Jesus alone. We allow those whom Jesus has clearly put into our lives to point us to Jesus, whomever that might be. Jesus is not divided, and those who are called by him to do his work are in him, so you cannot reject those around you whom God has put into your life to help you see Jesus and still claim to follow Jesus. You cannot reject those whom God has sent to help you to focus on him and still claim to be a follower of Christ. Jesus uses his church to bring you closer to himself. Jesus and the church are not divided. We don't all have a different agenda. If our agenda or our mission is the glory of Jesus, then all the people of the church, whether they are leaders or not, are placed in your life to help you to bring glory to Jesus, to glorify Jesus for what he's done. He has done the impossible and saved us sinners and brought us into his kingdom. Can you imagine on a football team if the defensive players said that they would only listen to the defensive coordinator? And if the offensive part of the team that said that they would only listen to the offensive coordinator and the special teams players said that they would only listen to the special teams coach and none of them would pay any attention to the head coach, it just makes no sense because the defensive coach is carrying out the mission of the head coach and the offensive coach is carrying out the mission of the head coach and the head coach is carrying out his mission through the coaches and the players that are under him. They're one team, they're unified together on mission to win the game, to win the championship. 
Or imagine if the entire team said that they would only listen to the head coach and they would disregard all of the coaches. Well, that would not make any sense either because the defensive coordinator, the offensive coordinator, and the special teams coach, they're all carrying out the instructions and the mission of the head coach. In Grace Warman, it is the same. If you only listen to Clay or only listen to me, you're only you're failing to see the bigger picture. If you don't, or if you don't listen to us and you only claim to listen to Jesus, then you're missing what Jesus has for you through what he has called us to preach and to teach. We're under Jesus and we are just carrying out his mission in different ways. We are under the direction of our head coach, Jesus Christ, who is using us as players and coordinators to carry out his mission of saving for himself his people, that his people might make it to his kingdom. So let us be of one mind, of one mission, even though our parts of the mission might look very different. Apollos taught with eloquent speech and Paul not so much. And the sound of the messages and the ways in which the messages were worded might have been very different, but they promoted the mission of the head coach to proclaim the gospel of Jesus, that people might hear the gospel and be saved by it. This is our mission at Grace Warman. Would you join us on this mission? Let's pray. Father, would you grant us unity here in Grace Warman? Would you grant us a love for you that brings all of us closer together? I pray for your help in teaching and preaching the good news of the gospel. I pray for your help so that each one of us would see that our mission is one, to continually proclaim the gospel and grow closer to you, to put to death sin and love you more. Forgive us for any division that distracts us from the fact that we are all in one family, in one kingdom, part of one mission, just performing different parts of that same mission. I pray that the knowledge that what we have been saved from and what we have been saved to will bring us closer together as a church, that we might be one as Jesus prayed, so that the world will know that Jesus is sent of you to save your people. I pray this in your name. Amen.